to be with you as we continue to move forward in this Easter season. I don't know about you, but my heart is filled with joy. I thank and praise God for the gift of our salvation and the glory of the resurrection and all of the special favors that he wants to pour out upon us all of the time. But during these beautiful liturgical seasons, I think that they are flowing from heaven in with magnanimous force. That's exactly what I think is going on here. So we want to open up our hearts to be receptive to all that God wants to do in us and through us to the magnificence of his love for us, uh, for the beautiful way in which he continues to demonstrate it in and through all things, no matter how joyful, no matter how sorrowful he is present to us. And we have that assurance because of what we've just experienced and witnessed. We have witnessed, experienced his passion, his death, and his resurrection. And so we know that there is no travail in life, that there is no reversal in life, no sadness in life, for which that redemptive power of Christ, that redeeming grace that flows down Calvary's hill into our lives each and every day, we know that there is nothing that is greater nor more powerful than that. So we thank him and we praise him. I hope that you had a very blessed Easter. Um, I certainly did. We were spending it with family. Um, I had uh, uh, all of the grandchildren together. That was great fun. We were down there in South Florida and uh, all but two of our children were there and we just rejoiced and praised God and had a blast. We really did. Uh, really celebrating, really celebrating. We uh, did true to him together for the most part. Um, we didn't get there until Friday, so we had already done uh, Holy Thursday, of course. But all of that being said, it was a beautiful time, a beautiful opportunity. Uh, we spent Good Friday and Easter Sunday at Heart of Jesus Catholic Church there in Fort Lauderdale. It's a Maronite parish, so we celebrated uh, the Maronite liturgy uh, with Core Bishop Michael Thomas and all of the good people of that parish. It's always like coming home there. It's a unique experience for me. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. It's my daughter and son-in-law's home parish. It's not my home parish, but nonetheless, it, it, there's that uh, uh, lovely community there that's so nice. Anyway, all of that being said, we are happy to be with you today. It's Wednesday. You know what that means. It's a wacky Wednesday. Sue Brinkman is with us. Yes, she is. We're going to talk about some of the strange stuff that we see. Well, we'll be answering some questions that come to us via email and other sources, but we certainly do want to hear from you. 833-288-EWTN is the way that you can join us. That's 833-288-3986. I'm inviting you to uh, join us live here on Women of Grace Live. We love to have that holy conversation with you Monday through Friday at this point. Excuse me, at this same time, <clears throat> right here on this same station. Uh, and we also want to remind you to visit our website, womenofgrace.com. All kinds of good things going on. I'm going to tell you about that in just a moment. But I do want to let you know that in addition to being able to join us via phone at 833-288-3986, that's 833-288-EWTN, toll free for you right here in North America. You can also join us out there uh, online. Yep, at social media. Just go to EWTN Radio's YouTube channel and Facebook page, either one of them. Chat feature at both locations. Put your question or comment in there. We will get it. We will retrieve it. We will be happy to address it. We have Rich Jesse back in studio manning that control room and making it happen for us. In addition to that, Matthew Gubensky is out there on the phones. We invite you uh, to say howdy, hey to him when you call in. And I do believe, I do believe we have Michael McCall on social media. If not, I'm going to find out about that really soon. Uh, and we invite you uh, to use all of those means to join us today. When I take you out there to our website and give you a few highlights, again, it's womenofgrace.com. Uh, you're going to see that I think it's number one. Nope, it's number three in the slideshow. Uh, number three in the slideshow it is uh, letting you... Well, Maybe it's not. Maybe it's number four. I got to find it. It's in here. I just saw it. So it popped up somewhere along the way here as I was flipping. It's number three. Women of Grace's Melbourne Retreat is happening. Yes, it is. Usually we're there in July. Please make note, we're not in July this year. We're there the last weekend of June, June 28th through the 30th. That's when we're going to be there. Looking forward to it. Oh, my goodness. We have a beautiful, beautiful theme, Divine Mercy, Crucible of New Life. Isn't that exciting? Divine mercy, crucible of new life. So eager, eager to watch that theme and participate in developing that theme as we come together there at the Malvern uh, Retreat House there located in Malvern, Pennsylvania uh, for our, I don't know, I think this has got to be 
We've been going there since 2006. So how many years is that? It's a bunch of years, right? Uh, we've been going there for numbers and numbers of years. So we are excited to be back there again, this time, June 28th through the 30th. Father Ken Geraci is going to join us again. Uh, I'll tell you, it was a beautiful time with him last year. And our women just uh, really uh, so appreciated his spiritual paternity, uh, as well as as the way in which he ministered uh, to them uh, by way of of all of the sacraments that we received and the healing service that we had. And uh, they were telling us before we left, oh, I hope you'll have him back. I hope you'll have him back. So we secured him (laughs) at that very time. Uh, He just had to go back and check with his superior, of course, the uh, uh, provincial of his order and those kinds of things. But he was eager to come back and he is coming back. So that's June 28th through the 30th. Inviting you to get out there. Join us at Malvern. It's going to be a marvelous opportunity for us to come together. But I do want to let you know, here we are. It is April 3rd already. Oh, gracious sakes. Pretty soon we'll be into double digits and then the month will be over. But in the midst of this month, we are going to be at Our Lady of Florida Spiritual Center in North Palm Beach, Florida for our Benedicta, uh, in uh, beautiful, beautiful Benedicta Institute for Women. This is our first in-person immersive. We are so excited about it. We are going to be holding this with uh, with uh, Dr. Donald Wallenfang, who is our academic advisor. He's going to be leading us in a course called Who is Mary? The Journey. Excuse me. Who is Woman? The Journey from Eve to Mary. And I know, I know, I know it is going to be thrilling. Uh, it's going to be mind expanding in a lot of new ways. We're going to be talking about things like phenomenology and metaphysics. Uh, but we're going to be looking at all of this through uh, the lens of our Catholic faith and through the perspective of, of St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, Edith Stein, as we seek to answer that question, who is woman? We're going to be talking about it in reference to our Blessed Lady, obviously, uh, some of the great saints. We're going to be uh, looking at some other resources that are going to help to fill out the picture for us. It's going to be lovely. We also are going to have with us our spiritual advisor for Women of Grace and the Benedicta Institute, and that is Bishop William Walterscheid uh, there from the Diocese of Pittsburgh. He's going to be with us at the site celebrating Mass, uh, also offering us the opportunity for the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Uh, He is going to be giving us a mini lesson every night, uh, really for spiritual enrichment and and, and also another beautiful facet on this theme. Uh, We are just about to the number that we want. We have a few spots left available, not many, uh, about four, uh, maybe five, but that's it. So don't delay. Join us for this beautiful event that's coming up April 22nd. All of the information is at our website. You can contact us directly. We will talk with you. Uh, We will explain everything to you, but you can go out to our website, click on Benedicta Institute, and you can read about it. I'm really hoping that you are going to be joining us. 833-288-EWTN is the way that you can join us. I am looking forward. I am looking forward uh, to hearing from you. So please do give us a call, 833-288-EWTN or EWTN Radio's YouTube channel and Facebook page. Coming right back with Sue Brinkman. Stay with us. He was a bishop, apologist, and patron of the Catholic press. Matthew Bunsen and the Doctors of the Church. St. Francis de Sales preached in the area of Geneva for many years and used broadsheets and gentle apologetics to convert the Calvinists of the region. By the time of his death in 1622, tens of thousands had come back to the church. He was named patron of the Catholic press in 1923 and a doctor of the church in 1877. To find out more, visit EWTN.com and click on Catholicism. The most original and exclusive Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. I don't like looking back. I prefer to look forward and keep moving forward. There's plenty to cover. I do a lot of research and try to dig out the bits and pieces of a life or of an agenda that people don't want to talk about. The World Over with Raymond Arroyo. Thursday night, 8 Eastern on EWTN Radio and Television. Sisters in Christ, have you considered continuing your education? Now you can obtain a certification in Catholic women's leadership through the Benedicta Institute for Women. Our newly relaunched certification program begins April 22nd at Our Lady of Florida Spiritual Center in North Palm Beach, Florida. During this immersive week, you will study the topic, Who is Woman? The Journey from Eve 
to Mary, under the tutelage of Dr. Donald Wallenfang, a professor of theology and philosophy and academic advisor for the Benedicta Institute for Women, Most Reverend William Walterscheid of the Diocese of Pittsburgh and spiritual advisor to Women of Grace and the Benedicta Institute will also be with us. And of course, our very own Jonnet Williams will lead us through this immersive week of study. To learn more and to register, visit us at womenofgrace.com and click on Benedicta Institute or call 800-558-5452. Well, I'll tell you, when you hear that music, you know it's a weird and wacky Wednesday on Women of Grace with Sue Brinkman. Yep, and it is Wednesday, and we're going to be talking about some weird and wacky things out there. Uh, If there's any weird and wacky things that you want to talk about, we're eager to hear. Uh, We will certainly, certainly address them. 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-398. Eight six. Hey Sue, I guess I guess someone has to attack weird and wacky things, and it looks like it's you and me on Wednesdays. I don't know what to say. <laughs> How did we get nominated for that job? I, I do not know. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> Here we are. Well, Here we are. <laughs> oh, gee, was it great? Well, I'll tell you what. God has a sense of humor because I'll tell you. When I was a little girl, I would get weirded out by these things. I mean, really, I would have nightmares <laughs> for for weeks on end and to think that every week we are exploring these. But, you know, it's so important uh, because we're living in a very weird and wacky time. And the culture has certainly capitulated to all of these uh, varieties of ideologies that have grabbed hold of the attention, I think, of people that are not very well-rooted in their faith. Because if you're well-rooted in your faith, you're not easily uprooted uh, by these things, although uh, you can be swayed if you allow yourself to open portals and open doors to them. Exactly. We have so many opportunities for people to do that these days because of the new age and the proliferation of new age things like the energy medicine, you know, things like acupuncture, acupuncture, reflexology. This is all introducing people to um, these different types of energy and, and, and whole different, a whole different type of spirituality is being introduced to them through these different new age uh, techniques and practices. Um, So I think that the different meditation techniques that are coming from the East and that, we just have a lot more opportunities. When I was growing up, we did not have all this, Johnette. I mean, I can remember watching the movie The Exorcist when it came out. I think it was, what, 1973 or something. I watched that movie, and I slept for the next two weeks with the light on. Mm-hmm. I was terrified. I was terrified of that movie. Um, and that was just sort of like a, a an odd thing at the time. Now, all of our movies are about stuff like that. I don't, I don't know how these kids can sleep at night watching this kind of stuff. Between the violence and the occult, um, it's, it's really bad. It's really bad for their, their dear spirits to be absorbing all of this stuff. Um, you know, yeah, it's bad. I, I mentioned just this weekend that you know I was in South Florida um, at Thea and Micah's, and we were there with all of the children. And uh, you know, I mentioned that we attended the Maronite liturgy. And I was marveling at the fact that my um, seven-year-old granddaughter knows all of the Arabic and Syrian prayers. And, you know, I was talking with my sister about that, who is an educator. And I was saying, wow, you know, she just picked it up. She says, children are like little sponges. And this is something that I think that we forget today. They are like little sponges. You know, they are are so uh, easily uh, adaptable. And so when we're introducing these ideas to our children at young ages... These ideas are being absorbed by them, and there is a reaction and a response. For you, it was fear. You didn't want to turn the lights out, and you were not a little girl at that time, right? I mean, you were you were a young woman. High school. High, high school. school. Senior right. in high school, yeah. There you go. And, and But when there, we little, if, if you have that kind of a response when you can use your intellect to kind of ferret out what is real and what isn't real, uh, you know, what is, what is fiction, what isn't fiction, um, what is a story – uh, as opposed to what is a fact, you know, a tale as a fo- opposed to a fact, uh, then these little children who oftentimes have a difficulty separating the real from the make-believe, they're so impressionable. We don't want to give them this stuff. We don't want to give don't. it to them. You know, no, it just, and they'll absorb it. 
they do absorb it. And this is the, the whole thing I have about Harry Potter and those type of books when they first came out, what, 20 years ago or something. Mm -hmm. Now you have a whole generation of people that have grown up on that stuff. They've been so desensitized to all of that. They don't think it's all that bad. Magic, the use of sorcery, that's become to them a tool. Mm -hmm. It's just something to use um, for bad or for good. It doesn't matter, but you, it's just a tool. It's, it's, it's you know, uh, morally neutral. Um, and, and they've grown up on all this stuff. And we don't realize that when you expose them to that, just like you're saying, they don't know the difference sometimes between reality and fiction. It all gets blended together with them. And they start to adapt and adopt some of these practices that That's they're right. they're. Uh, reading in the book. I, I, I remember reading a story once about uh, little children that were using uh, the bus driver spell to get their bus drivers to do what they wanted and not be mean to them or something like that. I mean, this is what kids do when they're introduced to this kind of stuff. They mimic it. They don't know. They don't know if there's nobody really sitting there telling them and explaining to them what's wrong with it. They just, oh, this is great. Let's just do this ourselves. Let's just use this magic. Maybe it'll work for me. What's to stop yes. them from that? Nothing. That's exactly right. And they're not discerning. But but unfortunately, you know, because of poor catechesis mm -hmm. and other things, there's a lot of adults out there who are Catholic that are not discerning either. And, and it's to that end, really, that we uh, offer this program so that we can tease out what is real, what isn't real, what is authentic spirituality, and what is a pseudo spirituality, a false spirituality. Uh, because, you know, we, we, there, there, there is a spiritual realm. Uh, we know that that's the case. But it's not benign in all cases, <laughs> you know, and, and we've exactly. got this notion that it is and we get get ourselves all messed up. It, what, but people do gravitate to things that are titillating, that excite the senses mm -hmm. and excite the imagination. And you have a blog out there. And, and listen, friends, I want to direct you to the New Age blog that is on our website, womenofgrace.com. Uh, Sue, uh, you know, is always researching and putting up answers to questions that come into us. You can get your questions to Sue. Uh, she'll tell you how to do that. But you can always go to womenofgrace.com and access the New Age blog. Uh, it, there's a link right on the homepage there. You can go to newage.womenofgrace.com newage.womenofgrace.com and get there directly if you prefer. Uh, but you have a blog up there on the physics of ghosts. And when you mentioned the title yeah. to me, I had to, I had to say, ask you to repeat it. What is that exactly? The physics of ghosts. Uh, fascinating topic. Share. Yes, yes. Well, that's because oftentimes when we're talking about ghosts and how disembodied human souls cannot just appear on their own in front of somebody. They need some agency. They need some power that's going to allow them and facilitate that appearance for them because they don't have the ability. And I say to people, well, that's not just religion. That's physics. Well, so somebody wrote and said, what do you mean by that? What do you mean physics? What does that have to do with ghosts? Well, you know, many people believe that science has proven the existence of ghosts based on a belief that Albert Einstein came up with the scientific basis uh, for the reality of ghosts when he posited that energy of the universe is constant and can neither be created nor destroyed. Therefore, when a person dies, the electrical energy in their bodies is not destroyed, but it is transformed into another form of energy. And that new energy form is what is referred to as a ghost. The problem with that, with that is that scientifically, according to physics, that theory is flawed. What happens to a person's energy after they die is really not mysterious at all. After you die, the energy in your body goes where all organisms' energy go after death, and that goes back into the environment. So when a human dies, the energy stored in his or her body is released in the form of heat and transferred into the animals that eat it, you know, while the insects or the worms or the bacteria um, if we're interred, and, and the plants that absorb us. So if we are cre cremated, the energy in our bodies is released in the form of heat and light. So in other words, when you eat dead plants and animals, you're actually consuming their energy and converting it for your own use. So that's really what happens to energy. It doesn't just take another shape and then, you know, walk around at people's houses in the middle of the night throwing pots and pans around. This, this does not, it doesn't happen that way. That's just in you know, Hollywood, that Hollywood makes it up. But, you know, ghost hunters, they use all kinds of fancy equipment to detect this energy fields created by ghosts. But once an organism dies, it doesn't generate energy anymore. Why? Because 
it doesn't have a, the physical capacity to do that now. It's dead. Okay. So, and the one thing I do stress though in the blog is there's a difference between veritable energy, what we're talking about here, and putative, which is the chi, key, you know, prana, universal life force. Uh, veritable energy, that's the stuff that we know is in our bodies. We do have energy in our bodies. Those are mechanical vibrations, electromagnetic forces, uh, magnetism, monochromatic, monochromatic uh, radiation, um, and, and, you know, rays from other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. That's all inside of us. But at the time of death, when your body shuts down and stops generating energy, whatever energy is still stored in the body is simply released and absorbed into the environment. It's not like putative energy, which they claim is out there and it, you know, infests everything. Um, and it, it, it goes on forever. Nobody's ever been able to scientifically substantiate the existence of this energy. And we've been looking for it since the time of Sir Isaac Newton. I think by now with the advances in, in our technology and our science, we would have been able to find that. So that's what I mean when I say a disembodied human soul can't appear as a ghost, can't appear to a human being um, except uh, through either God, who is a supernatural being, of course, and he is, he's got the power to do that, to facilitate that body. They almost have to like a bo borrow a body from somebody who can create it. Or a preternatural being, which would be a, an angel or a devil. And because God already tells us in Deuteronomy 18.10, he's not going to have anything to do with necromancy. Um, or uh, he's never going to allow a soul or facilitate or no, he's not going to do. Yeah, he's not going to do that. He's not going to get involved in any of that stuff. So, um, an, a good angel only exists to do the will of God. So they're not going to do it either. And if the the disembodied human soul doesn't have the the capability of doing it, there's only one left, one force left that could create a ghost, and that's the devil. So that's why the church teaches what she teaches. That most yeah. hauntings are more than likely <clears throat> being uh, are, are ha being had through the agency of an evil spirit. So, uh, but even when the evil one is doing that, it's not really the soul or the body of the person that they that that is uh, supposedly appearing to them. Uh, right. It is. It's a demon that's taking on that them. form. Right. And the and the demon knows exactly who that person was because they observe us. They right. observe us in life. They've been doing that since Adam and Eve. I mean, they they that's just what they do. They're very good at it. They know exactly what your Uncle Joe used to call you, the nicknames. You know how your mom used to pull in those little hairs on your temple. They know all these little tiny, you know, uh, nuances about mm -hmm. our loved one. The devils know all that stuff. They know it all. Yeah. Um, and and they, they just watching. reproduce it. Yeah. That's right. Well, you know, uh, we, we don't want ourselves to get confused, and this is why it is that we stay very close to the teachings of the church. This is why we know our catechism. Uh, this is why we stay clear of these things that can wind us up in knots and really ensnare us. We don't want that to happen. A33288, EWTN, that's A33288. 3986 is the way that you can join us today. We have Mike with us. Uh, he's in Pennsylvania, Sue. We're going to take his call here. JMJ Radio is the way that he's listening to us, and we're delighted you're with us today. Mike, how are you? Hello, Mike. And, uh, Hi. Hi. <laughs> you're on the um, air. Now I can hear you. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Um, thank you for taking my call, and uh, happy Easter to you both. And um, Thank you. I, I wanted to ask about a, um, a certain book that I've read. I've read about four times. Uh, I know that objects, from listening to your show, objects can be cursed. But my question was, can the story itself, it's a, it's a pretty weird story. Um, it's, it's not overly popular, and I don't know if I should say the name or the author. Uh, it is a suspense story, uh, and it, I read it in a, in a used book I bought at a Salvation Army. And um, it, um, it, it comes, it has to do with things that we see out of the corner of our eye, uh, okay. you know, the trick of light or shadow or things like that. And uh, once you read the story, you, you always come back to it because um, that's a natural thing that happens. You know, and I, I think it happens to everybody. What is the name but of the story and the author? The, the story is called They Bite. Okay. And the um, the name of the author is uh, his last name is Boucher, 
Uh, I think it's a it's a French name. Um, but he was a uh, a writer who uh, wrote many suspense uh, stories. Uh, I think during the fifties. Um, I haven't read any other any any other stories by him, but he was a favorite of uh, Alfred Hitchcock. And um, and ever since I've I've read the story four times, let's say. Um, ever since I read it the first time, um, the the level of uh, I don't know if, if it's me or or if it's uh, you know just a little bit of paranoia on my part, um, but the level of sightings uh, of things that you cannot look at directly once you try to look at them directly they, they sort of uh, vanish uh, has increased and uh, and so I've stopped reading it even though it's it's a favorite um, um, because of that um, mm-hmm. and so I wanted to know if if it was possible for a story itself to be um to be a way for a for a demon to uh, to affect us mm-hmm. okay. Sue? yeah absolutely absolutely you know he can affect you through that he's already affecting you just by saying mm-hmm. how you know you you start to see things uh and that yeah absolutely that can happen to you as far as the the book or something being cursed no that's very un- that would be unlikely um i remember when okay. i saw the exorcist movie i had read the exorcist book and when i was reading the book i refused to sleep with the book in my room i put the book out in the hallway i didn't want it in my room <laughs> but i was just simply terrified of what i was reading in the book is what it was and i wanted to get it away from me but yes, you can be very, very influenced by that. It can begin to change the way you think and look at things so that you're looking at them in a way that the devil wants you to look at them. And especially to keep you frightened and on the alert and anxious. He loves all those things because then you can't hear the promptings of the Holy Spirit. So he loves to keep you all churned up inside with fear and anxiety and worry mm-hmm. uh, and suspicion. That's another big one of his. Um, so I guess I would I would say yes to that. What do, what do you think, Johnette? Well, I, I, I guess I'm curious a little bit, Mike, on what about it attracts you so much. Is, is, it, is it the suspense of it? Is it the, um, the psychology of it? What, what is it that, that brings you back to it time and again? Well, it, it does. I mean, it, the story has a resolution uh, in, in what these things are. And, and uh, it's, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a happy ending, let's say. Mm-hmm. But um, um, what what attracted me? Well, when I first read it, I just read it out of curiosity. It was a it was a simple title and it was a short story. And um, it's that I I've, I've talked to other other folks that have read it, and they've all had the same experience. That mm-hmm. um, a, a couple of friends that it okay. in, the sightings what, have increased on on their perception. What, here, here, here's what I would have you do. Hold the line there. Stay with us. We're, we're going to go to a break. We'll come back and, and we'll talk about this a little bit more. And we want to hear from you too, friends. 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. That's the way you can join us. That's how Mike did it. You can do it too. We're available for you outside of North America too. Country code one two zero five two seven one. 2985 and don't forget about EWTN Radio's YouTube channel and Facebook page. We're coming right back. Stay with us. The most original Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. How often should I forgive my brother, Lord? Seven times? St. Peter thought seven was a good number. I would have said three times, Lord. <laughs> My Lord said, no, 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 no. Seventy times, seven times a day. Mother Angelica Live Classics. Every morning, 2 Eastern, on EWTN Radio. This is Life Issues with Brad Mattis, president of Life Issues Institute. Idaho passed legislation protecting nearly all unborn babies, so Planned Parenthood established an abortion facility just across the border in Ontario, Oregon, within an hour of Boise, Idaho. But things aren't going so well for the abortion giant. The day they opened, Stanton Healthcare, a pro-life pregnancy center, parked their 36-foot mobile clinic out front. 
While it was down for repairs during the winter, a business owner loaned out her space so they could set up shop offering alternatives to abortion. Planned Parenthood is struggling to stay in business because Ontario is a pro-life town and they can't get enough staff to keep the place open. They even asked police to make the mobile clinic move, but that didn't work. Please pray for these faithful defenders of life. Follow us on social media at Life Issues Institute. The EWTN Warriors Rosary is a fitting tribute to all the spiritual warriors who have stood by us over the years. Each rosary is a unique creation. Get your Warriors Rosary today at EWTNRC.com. Hi, this is Cy Kellett. Join us later today on Catholic Answers Live as we do our best to explain and defend the Catholic faith. Catholic Answers Live, 6 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Now, back to Women of Grace. The Women of Grace phone lines are open. 1-833-288-EWTN. 1-833-288-3986. Well, welcome back, everybody. We're so happy you're with us today on this Wacky Wednesday. Sue Brinkman in the house. We're talking about the weird and the wacky right here on Wednesday, and we are looking forward to hearing from you. Phone lines are lighting up, but we've still got a few opportunities available for you there. 833-288-EWTN is the way that you can join us. That's 833-288-3986. It's a toll-free number. Available for you, too, at EWTN Radio's YouTube channel and Facebook page. Just get out there and use the chat feature to put in your question or comment. We'll get it retrieved and up on the board. In addition to all of that, we're available uh, to you as well out there. Uh, if you're outside of North America, country code one two zero five. 2712985 inviting you to check out our website womenofgrace.com all kinds of good things there are available for you to help you to live that abundant life in our Lord Jesus Christ and to share it with others. Sue Brinkman's blog, The New Age, is there for you. We've got, I don't know, just a bunch as well over, you know, I keep saying 12, 1,200 to 1,600 questions and answers. I'm sure uh, it might be beyond that range right now. I don't know. Sue would know better, but I don't know that she has the time to go back and count out up everything that she's done, put up out there over all of these many years. But it is there for you, arranged by topic and also a uh, search engine available for you there. It's available uh, alphabetically, uh, all kinds of ways to access the information that you need to find. Uh, additionally to all of that, Sue does have a uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, podcast right there at our website. Go out there to our library. It's called Grace Under Fire, Exposing the Darkness. She talks about some of these issues uh, in podcast form. So we invite you to check all of that out as well. We have Mike with us. He's from PA talking about a story, a uh, short story by Anthony Boucher. It's called They Bite. Um, it, it, it seems to be the kind of a story that gets under your skin. <laughs> I don't mean that to be, <laughs> uh, to be uh, too literal, but it seems as though it might well do that. And um, so it, it, it begins, I think, in a sense, almost to haunt you. And, and that's kind of where I wanted to go with this, Mike. Uh, obviously, it's captured your imagination. And oftentimes when our imagination is captured, our imagination can also play tricks on us. That is not to limit, however, the shenanigans of the devil and his minions. And if they see that we have a particular interest uh, in some way, they do have powers uh, that are preternatural, as Sue was mentioning earlier in the program. And these powers that are preternatural come by way of the angelic gifts that they were given prior to their fall. God did not take away the gifts. It says in sacred scripture that God does not take his gifts away, even if they're abused. And we see evidence of that in, in our own day and time. We have very gifted people, brilliant people, who use their minds to perpetrate evil on other people uh, or to steal their money, uh, you know, or whatever the case may be. So God doesn't take away the gift simply because they're using those gifts in a fallen way. And so that's true with the angels, too, who fell. Uh, they maintain these gifts. And so they do have powers, all of the powers that were there, theirs by way of the choir and the hierarchy of angel uh, that they were uh, are still there and still operative and now they use them for dastardly deeds and so they can they can you know perform tricks uh, and and I would say that it, because you're calling uh, and because you're recognizing that there might be 
and I'm going to use this term, and I, 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 I don't mean to be, uh, you know, to, to be embarrassing in any way, but, you know, our appetites can get stirred up, and we can have a morbid curiosity about things, um, and unhealthy curiosity, where we keep digging and digging and digging, and that's when I think there's a possibility that we're being influenced in a negative way. Sue, what do you think? Absolutely. I agree with uh, with that 100%. I just think that um, it, it can influence you. It Obviously, it has been influencing him, uh, Mike, if he, if he is calling about it. The fact that he's calling about it, though, to me, is a very good thing. Oh, yes, it's because very, Because he's looking out for himself. It's a very but good it, thing. It he's shows that he's himself. concerned. He wants to understand. Yeah. And he yeah, wants that, to that understand. That was what I was emphasizing, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that that was a good thing that, that you even brought that up. Um, because there's a lot of books out there, not just They Bite, there's a lot of books out there that I think are, are um, doing that, influencing people in, mm-hmm. in ways that aren't good. Uh, and I think we need to learn and, uh, how to be a little bit more vigilant about what we read mm-hmm. and what we consider to be entertaining. If it's something that really does grab our, our morbid curiosity, make it make a penance out of it. Make a sacrifice of it to say, you know what, I'm not going to read this kind of stuff anymore because it's it's bloody or it's violent or it's it's evil. I'm not going to engage in this anymore um, and put that aside and and make that some sort of a sacrifice or a penance that you that you put put upon yourself in order to protect yourself from being influenced in, in any way by that kind of darkness. Um, yeah. That's what I would do with it. I would get rid of it. I wouldn't yeah. continue to read it. And I think that that's a sign of spiritual maturity. Um, and so, mm-hmm. Mike, that's what I would recommend. I would recommend you get rid of the book. I would recommend that you go to the sacrament of uh, confession. I would recommend that you bring this up in the sacrament and say, you know, th- there is this short story that I've read several times, and um, I seem to to return to it and read it again. Uh, and I feel like I might be being in some way influenced by it. You can even share with the priest what it's about. And what you want to do is you want to repent renounce and reject that's what you want to do the three r's there uh you you want to repent uh um you you want to reject the book get rid of it um and you want to renounce any kind of tie or hold that it could have uh exerted on you and don't go back to it and if i may sue from my own life i'll give an example of this um, you know, people are pretty well familiar with my story. You know, I, I lived a dissolute life for two years of my college experience. And I will not let myself listen to the music from that time era. I enjoy some mm-hmm. of that music, you know, on, on, on just a level of enjoyment. But I find that when I listen to it, then my imagination takes me back there. My memory takes me back there. That's not a healthy place for me to go. And so I have to... Uh, not listen to that kind of music anymore. So anytime that we see that something has the capacity to even, you know, stir up our imagination in in some way, uh, that leads us back to uh, uh, moments in time that are best left in the past because they've been repented of, et cetera, then we've we've got to pay attention to that and and we've got to put the proper, uh, you know, restrictions on ourselves. To not go back there. I think it would be the same for anybody who, uh, you know, let's even use like a recovering alcoholic, for example, uh, or somebody that did drugs. If they start stirring up and talking about all of those times, then yeah. that that taste for it, you know, can rise to the surface. The evil one will get right in there and try to disturb the peace that God wants them to know. So anyway... That's just something I've learned, and I don't mind sharing it because, you know, that that's what we're about here on Women of Grace. That's right. I, I like what you're saying, though, about that music. Like during those times when I was away from the church, it was a long time, much longer than the, your two years. I was gone for at least 15 years um, and, and all that music. during the, But I like that music. Like you said, I like those songs. I like that mm-hmm. music. Um, but you know, does it take me back there? It makes me – it's really making me stop and think now. Is that taking me back to places that I really – I would never want to go back there anyway. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> like, no. Uh, you know, I don't. Um, but it can it raise up a nostalgia. You know, like mm-hmm. a nostalgia. You know. Yeah. Uh, it really you know, it, yeah. It's 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 interesting. Well, I was gone from the church for ten years, but the two years were years that uh, you know I was you know tripping the light fandango, so to speak. You know. Um, yeah. <laughs> not not good years. Uh, and all of that being said, it, you know, long since repented of, but the fact of the matter is it, it, we have to take custody, Mike, is what I'm saying. 
Does any of this, are you still there, Mike? <laughs> We've just yep, been chatting yep, away. I does any of that make sense off. to you? Yes, it does, because um, especially when you mentioned uh, earlier times or music, there is music that uh, that brings back memories that uh, that I also do not do not listen to it anymore. Um, yeah. You know, from high school and early time uh, in college and things like that. And and you, you're right. You're, you're so correct. Uh, coming back to those memories um, can can immediately uh, change your perspective or, or your um, you know how you mm -hmm. feel about where you are now in life. You know it. it and and I've, yeah. I've avoided things like that. So so thank you for that. Um, you know that that comparison. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. So, and I I agree. I I, I would I would probably listen to uh, Paradise Lost by Milton rather than this. <laughs> <laughs> it's a better choice. Because <laughs> we sure don't want to lose Paradise. <laughs> That was, oh, Mike. Great, Mike. that was a great discussion. I, I, that was really a good good topic. Thank you for that, Mike. I'm yeah, grateful for truly. It. And I want to thank you for your docility of heart, too. Uh, you, you know, you came with a very receptive heart. So thank you very much for demonstrating that to us today. We can all learn by your good example there, Mike. Thank you. God bless you, Mike. All right, we're going to go on to Julianne. She is in Fort Worth, Texas today, listening to us via the EWTN app. How are you doing there, Julianne? Hello, how are you this morning? We're great. How about yourself? Great, thank you. Oh, good, good. Well, you had been talking about apparitions of, of uh, spirits, and um, I just came back from Rome, but prior to going, I had read this book called Hungry Souls, and it's about um, various apparitions that have appeared to many, many whole people requesting prayers, um, evidence of them being in purgatory, and there is a church in Rome, and I'm sure you're well aware of it. It's called the uh, Sacred Heart of Suffrage um, yeah. in Rome. And it's like that white Gothic church that's just, you know, a 10-minute walk from the, from the Vatican. They have a museum there where they have evidences of people or souls who have been reaching out for prayer from um, um, various different people. And even, I think, St. Faustina had reported um individuals reaching out to her um, and, and ask, requesting prayer. And so, you know, of course we need to discern that, you know, whether this is something of God or if this is a, uh, you know, a demonic um, being that is attempting to contact. But what I just was curious as to what you would say to that. To me, what it says is that we must pray, pray, pray for the souls in purgatory. And um, have, we visited... There, well, my my husband and myself and and a couple of other ladies who were on a, a pilgrimage there. We 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 all prayed a rosary while we were there. Mm -hmm. And so, but uh, what what do you say about that? Because those are apparitions. There are apparitions that can possibly re be reaching out for for prayer. Go ahead. Sir. Exactly, exactly. But God does. God facilitates those. God allows those. God permits them. No human disembodied soul can appear without the permission of God. And as we know, as you're just saying here, um, he, he allows that. And we have history. I know all about that museum, by the way. It's got really incredible stuff in there, burn marks and everything on on uh, pieces of linen and all. It's really fascinating to look upon that. But yes, God does allow that. Um, and and we have many stories from our saints, uh, like Padre Pio is the one I'm thinking of in particular, mm -hmm. yeah. um, where uh, souls from purgatory came and asked for prayer. God permits that. Absolutely, he permits that. And he facilitates that and actually will allow and, and give them that body, so to speak, to make that appearance. Because remember, they don't have a body anymore. That person is deceased. That body is rotting in a grave somewhere. So God has to give that to him. And that's through the agency of his of his angels that he does that. Um, so, but he does not permit mediums like Teresa Caputo on the Long Island uh, medium. He, he, he's never going to permit that. He says in Deuteronomy 18, he calls those people an abomination who call for spirits. So that's the difference between evoking and invoking. When you invoke, you're calling upon someone to, to intercede for you. To evoke, you're calling them forth. You're asking them to appear. Evoking is what a medium does. Invoking is what we do when we pray to our saints and, and people. But we don't call them forth and say, hey, appear to me. We don't do things like that. Um, there's a big difference in there. But God does allow that, and God facilitates it. He does not, however, facilitate that um, for 
any kind of uh, mediums, uh, haunted houses and things like that. Uh, I know that, um, uh, oh, who is it now out in Pittsburgh? The um, We've had him on our shows a couple of oh, times. Adam Bly? Oh, Adam, Adam, Adam Bly. Yeah. And he talks about that. <laughs> it, it was somebody in a house, they say, oh, somebody committed suicide in that house. And that spirit is still in that house and they're haunting the house. Um, what he says is that it's more than likely the demon who who um, encouraged that suicide that's there. It's not the person. The person mm-hmm. has gone on to their reward. That's just the way it is. So I hope that explains that to you because it's, it's, it's a very important distinction to make, Julianne, that yes, God does allow it and he does facilitate it, but he does not facilitate that for uh, a medium or anything like that. He's, he's never going to cooperate with that. What they're seeing are demons who are imposing as people. Is what right. So seeing. how would you how would you um, um, discern whether if if, if a, a person has somebody or, or an apparition of some sort? How would you what would you recommend to go about discerning whether or not this is something that is of God or if this is something that is um, uh, to be um, <laughs> avoided at all costs or whatever? Uh, you know, right, I, right. I, 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 I would throw I, holy I, water. I, I would do what the saints did. Anytime the saints had an apparition, uh, they yeah, would throw uh, holy water at it. Yeah. Or if it, yeah. That's, if, <laughs> test the if, spirits. If, mm-hmm, if it's the devil or a minion, it's going to flee. You know, if, if the soul is of the Lord, it will stay. Um, and I would not get overly uh, enthused about it. You know, I've just, uh, I've been reading Sue, A Fire Within. <laughs> I am persisting and getting through the book. Oh, good, good. <laughs> because it's it's so wonderful. But I was just looking at you know uh, some of what um, Father Thomas Dubé writes that that uh, Teresa of Avila said. You know, just to dismiss it, take it to your spiritual director and talk with him about it. And and another way too is what does you know does it bring peace and calm or does it bring anxiety mm-hmm. and fear? I mean, there you know right. th- those are the kinds of things that I think that we can judge through the spirit or would be there if it's of the Lord. Yeah, so there's ways to discern it. And, and I know um, Adam Bly also says things like if like people, when they are appearing from purgatory, they generally don't speak. They don't right. say anything to you. They just right. stand there looking sad. And you just understand, God allows you to understand what that person is doing there. And mm-hmm. you don't feel fear, just like you were just saying, Jonette. You don't feel fear and anxiety. You might initially, but then when you see be the- Be startled. You, you, you can be startled. Yeah. You can be startled, but but you won't get that that deep down terrified feeling. You won't get that um, if it if it is a soul for purgatory who's who's asking for prayer. That so there's different ways to discern. It's a good question though, Julianne. It's it's you do have to discern it. You do have to test the spirits. Even just you know keeping that holy water right there um, and making sure that that you use that or tell them to say you know Jesus Christ is Lord and um, uh, you you do have to discern it. You do have to discern it. And you can, as John of the Cross teaches, anything that appears to you, you can dismiss it. Mm-hmm. You don't have to listen to anything like that because you don't need that in order to be saved. You don't need any of that. So, uh, yeah. But that's a great question, Julianne. Thank you for that. Does that help you, Julianne? Yeah, yes. And I'm just praying that no one ever comes to me. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, we- I don't know that I'm even- the ones that, have, that they have appeared to are very holy people, generally speaking. You know, as I read through the book and so forth, these are not your, not your, your, uh, uh, you know, garden variety <laughs> personality. Yeah. These are really holy people. So, uh, you know, hopefully I'll be holy enough that that they would. But I really don't want them. <laughs> really don't want <laughs> well, them. here's the thing. I think I I think that if you keep praying for the holy souls, <laughs> you know, your chances of the need for them to come and tell you that they need either that they're requesting your prayer will be limited. So keep praying for the holy souls. There's another book out there too. Uh, and I was trying to think of it and I finally found it here. Get us out of here by Maria Sima. Are you familiar with that one, Sue? Uh, I think I, I might've read that years ago now. Yeah, you probably would have. I mean, it's, it's, I came out in, uh, I think 2002. Uh, but, uh, Maria Sima was also visited by holy souls, uh, you know, and I think that it's, just, I, I think it's a grace that God gives. I don't think that we should go asking for it. And Julianne, you, you certainly aren't going in that direction. So, <laughs> but, you know, and, and that's the other thing, Sue, is how is it that they come? I mean, are we involved in a seance or, you know, 
are we tr are we trying to communicate with them? These are the, these are the things that that would make it also very very suspect. Julianne, yeah. I agree with Sue. It was a great question. Thank you so much for your call today. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, we, we we need to continue to use that gift of discernment that the Holy Spirit gives us. We have Marianne with us too, Sue. She's in St. Augustine, Florida, this morning. Sirius XM station one thirty is the way she's joining us. How are you, Marianne? We're going to try to get you in here in the last couple of minutes. Great. Hi, how are you doing? Thank you for uh, for allowing me to, to talk. <laughs> Good. Um, so, so what do you want to share? Uh, so um, I, I was speaking with uh, the person earlier, and what you and the other lady were speaking about, oh, about uh, 20 minutes ago, about um, uh, apparitions or or ghosts um, not coming from God but coming from the devil, and um, so as a young girl, I've seen and felt more more felt. But as I've grown older, I've seen more um, spirits. I don't call them ghosts; I call them spirits because they are spirits. Um, but um, you know, there, there's there's a lot going on in the world, and there are, there's, as you said, there's evil. There's there's so much more evil now than there was 10 years ago. And, I mean, we're, we're seeing it, I mean, and in, in people so much more now. And I see it in my son, my 19-year-old son, who was in my house uh, up until three weeks ago. And he's coming from a very dark place, always in his room, and... And I know that the devil has been at him um, for for a while. And there was, oh, uh, maybe two and a half weeks ago, we got our house left. And um, and I, I knew something was in our house. It, it had been feeling very heavy. Um, I was yelling a lot. I didn't feel good. Um, I felt like just depressed and dark and lonely and and I, I just didn't know what was going on and Lord knows what he was doing in his room and um, so we had a major falling out and I had our priest bless our house now when he was blessing my son's room I was taking a step forward and as I did that you know the, the the priest was saying his prayers, you know, blessing his room. And this force pushed me back, and I felt like I was choking. My daughter was there. The priest was there. He didn't know what was going on. I couldn't I couldn't catch my breath. I felt like I was being choked. And it mm -hmm. was right at my chest. And I know that was absolutely evil. I've seen the, the devil years ago straight in my face, and I couldn't breathe, couldn't move, couldn't, I mean, I was paralyzed. We're into that last minute, Marianne. And I, I, and I hear the data, but I've also felt my my dad's spirit a day after he passed yeah. where I absolutely fell down crying, screaming up to my mom, dad's here. Yeah. So, Marianne, I'm, I'm sorry, darling. I've, 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 I've got to hold it there. Sue, we have 30 seconds. These things are possible, correct? Absolutely, they are possible. And the, the one sign where you felt that you were being strangled or whatever, that's, you know, obviously that's oppression. Um, so there was something was in the house. You did the smart thing to have that house blessed and have those spirits chased away. Right. Absolutely, you did. And, and sometimes when these mystical gifts come, we're never, we're never to seek them. If God gives them to us, we receive them. But... We're always, always relying on him. God bless all of you. We got to leave it right there, right down to the wire. Hi, I'm Debbie Giorgiani. Adam